chapter 1. What is real love? Love is not just feelings. The fact that love is not just feelings is what makes love a mystery. Many uninformed people see love as just feelings they have for someone. Eventually, they end up disappointed with heartaches when this love seems not to be reciprocated. This is because love is not just feelings. A mystery is something that cannot be known or understood except it is revealed. There are truths about life that people have not taken out time to seek by acquiring the right knowledge. Many rather walk on assumptions or pick up corrupt knowledge from wrong sources. Love is one of such truths about life except revelation is obtained from the appropriate source, one is bound to become a victim, thereby suffering disappointments and heartaches. The mystery of love can only be unveiled by the author of love, God himself, by the help of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps our understanding of the mysteries of life, including the mystery of love. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 13. God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit, which things the Holy Ghost teacheth. What exactly is love? Love means different things to different people at different phases of their lives. At the phase of being single, you need to particularly watch how you define love and how others around you define it, especially when relating with the opposite sex. In the English language, love is a single word used with different meanings. For instance, someone may say, I love my car or I love my dog and still say, I love my wife. Certainly, all three do not have the same value to this person. This proves that although the word love is used in all three instances, it does not mean the same thing. Also, from the scriptures, we see the word love in the Greek language is used with different meanings. From the common expressions in which the word is used, Love can be used in broadly three different ways which give expression to the word. We shall examine these different expressions of love as used in scriptures. The first word used and translated as love is the Greek word eros. This can also be called romantic love. We see an account in 2 Samuel chapter 13. It says, And Amnon said, I love Tamar, my brother, Absalom's sister. He took hold of her and said unto her, Come, lie with me, my sister. And she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me. How be it? He would not hearken unto her voice. But being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. This kind of love is hormone-driven, as we see from the above scriptures. When someone says, I love you, in this case, it means he or she is driven by sexual desires. This is as a result of the sex hormones at work. This is why it is hormone-driven love. It is a desire to have sex, and this does not necessarily mean commitment. It only means that the fellow wants to satisfy a particular desire that meets his or her own need. 
This is the lowest kind of love. It is romantic love expressed through the act of sex. A lasting relationship cannot be built on this. If this type of love is not nourished with friendship and commitment in a marriage, it will die. The second Greek word used is philio. This also means friendship love. I love you in this context means I am fond of you. I enjoy your company. You are a friend and I like you. An example of this is what existed between Daniel and the prince of the Enochs, as we see in Daniel chapter 1, verse 9. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the Enochs. Friendship love is important in a marriage, as a couple in a marriage is to be best of friends and enjoy each other's company. If this kind of love is not developed in marriage, the couple will experience frustration. It is during courtship that friendship is to be developed. If you miss it then, you may end up as strangers with nothing in common when married. Proverbs 18.24 A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. This kind of love is emotion-driven, and rational thinking. One way friendship-based love is destroyed in courtship is when premarital sex is indulged in. The third word is the Greek word agape. This means unconditional love and can also be referred to as covenant love. It is the kind of love God has for us. I love you in this context means I appreciate you and I'm committed to you no matter what happens. I am willing to give myself for you. This is a selfless kind of love. This love is based on commitment. It binds people together like in a covenant. This commitment will not allow you to take advantage of each other, rather, you give advantage to each other. It also describes the love between God and man, the kind of love that made one to give his life for another. As we see in John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man may lay down his life for his friends. 1 John 3, 13. Verse 16, hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. This means the test of true love is in the level of sacrifice you are willing to make for one another. It is covenant as seen in the scriptures between David and Jonathan. Jonathan was King Saul's son and heir apparent to the throne when King Saul dies. Jonathan knew this, but he was willing to give up the throne for David. 1 Samuel chapter 23, 17 and 18 says, And he said unto him, And thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee. And they made and the two made a covenant before the Lord. Now notice, it is Saul speaking here to David. David acknowledged their commitment to each other in a covenant relationship, even in Jonathan's death. Second Samuel verse, chapter 1 verse 26 says, I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Thy love to me was wonderful. Passing the love of women. This is David speaking concerning Jonathan. Covenant love is sacrifice driven and characterized by commitment. From the above illustrations, 
we can see that when someone says, I love you, or he or she could mean any one of the three definitions. Therefore, it is important you know what people mean when they say to you, I love you. Love in marriage. In seeking a marriage partner, love is the fundamental motivation which leads to marriage. Actually, love is the acid test that enables you to recognize easily who to or not to marry. But before making a lifetime commitment of marriage, you must understand the true meaning of love and be sure that person you intend to marry also understands the true meaning of love. This you do by subjecting your love for one another to the test of purity. 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. The New International Version says, This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. If a person claims to love you, they will be prepared to maintain purity in the relationship with you. You cannot love someone and at the same time encourage them to disobey God. If love is in you, then God will be in you. And if God is in you, then love will be in you. However, if you do not have God in you, then you cannot have love to give. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. You can only give what you have. If someone does not have God, he or she cannot love you beyond the sensual or romantic love. And a marriage cannot be built on that. It is dangerous. 1 John 4, 12 and 16 says, No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us. And his love is perfected in us. And we, know, we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. For a relationship to be meaningful, it must be built on trust and transparency. These are the products of love. Without love, you will walk in deception. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. And there is no occasion of stumbling in him. For he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness. Darkness has blinded his eyes. 1 John 2, 9-11 In other words, when choosing a life partner, do not marry someone you do not love and you know does not love you. As earlier noted, Love is God's adhesive power that binds us in a relationship, especially when tending towards marriage. This is why husbands are commanded to love their wives and wives are to love their husbands. In Ephesians 5.25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Titus 2, 4, the women are to love their husband. When someone feels love, he or she opens up to an authentic relationship. A marriage relationship is designed by God to last a lifetime. And this requires more than the romantic love 
which is based on feelings. Both covenant love and friendship love are needed in addition for the marriage to last a lifetime. The absence of the two can result in crisis. It is all the three expressions of love together that work to make a marriage fulfilling. Unconditional or covenant love gives the stability that makes a marriage last. Friendship love makes it healthy while romantic love adds zest and excitement in the marriage. Unconditional love. The unconditional love or covenant love actually forms the foundation of love in marriage. This is because this kind of love is stable and gives strength to the marital relationship. It is the God kind of love and it is free from selfishness. Friendship love. This is also, there is also the need for friendship love in marriage. Every successful couple must, must first be friends and this friendship grows throughout the marriage. This is what keeps the man cutting his wife for life. They enjoy each other's company. They can discuss anything with ease and not feel ashamed. It is friendship love that brings about the ability to be united intellectually, socially, and emotionally. It makes you friends for life. Romantic love. Romantic love is derived from the word romance. It is based on romantic feelings and can only be meaningful when the couple is married. Romantic love involves sex, and sex is a covenant tool in the covenant of marriage. This is one reason sex without a marriage commitment is building upon a faulty foundation. In the marriage, sex is an instrument of fulfilling wholesome desires. However, it is important to note that there is an order in which the three expressions of love must work if you are to have a fulfilling marital love. The unconditional love is to form the basis of any relationship that will last. There is also the need to take time to build friendship before the decision to marry is concluded. Romantic love then comes later when the marriage is consummated. The illustration shows the proper order to be followed. Illustration one, foundation with agape. The foundation of true love starts from the agape, the covenant way. It transcends to feel you and then to the eros. When we understand and walk in the agape, it becomes easy to understand and walk in the filio and eros. However, if the felt relationship is based on the eros to start with, it is bound to fail, as we can see in the next illustration, because the base is unstable. Illustration 2, Foundation with Eros. Some relationships emphasize friendship and leave out the covenant love entirely. This is not good enough. This is because without the unconditional or covenant love, the relationship is bound to overemphasize romance. The friendship love is not strong enough to sustain ties in times of adversity. It is bound to fail. Illustration 3. Foundation with filio only and no agape. 
People complain that love reduces after marriage. This is evidence that something is wrong. There must either be a missing ingredient, i.e. one of the different kinds of love is missing, or the order was not followed. True love can only be built on agape, which has the ability to keep the marriage and all other kinds of love, the filio and eros, keep it alive. One other attribute of love, as we will get to see in a later chapter, is that it has the ability to grow. Therefore, as you get to know each other better, love is to grow deeper. This is why couples truly in love experience deeper love and devotion for each other with time. As the saying goes, good wine tastes better with time, so also it is with marriage. It gets better with time. At this point, it is important to mention that agape is a product of a new life given to man in Christ Jesus. Man in his sinful state has the nature of selfishness and hatred. As a result of the loss of the glory, he cannot experience agape, which is the true nature of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 he can only experience filio and eros. To experience agape, his nature must change. This change occurs when eternal life is imparted to the spirit of man by accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. Eternal life is the life of God, which is imparted to us through Christ Jesus. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. This is what it means to be born again. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. John 3, 5 to 7. If you have not yet received Jesus as your Lord, or you did in the past and backslid, pause for a moment and be reconciled to God by saying this prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of eternal life. I believe Christ died for me and rose from the dead for my justification. I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior now, and I ask for the forgiveness of my sins. Thank you, Father, for adopting me into the family in Jesus' name, amen. I congratulate and welcome you to this family of God. You have just been imparted with eternal life, a new nature. The old nature of sin has been removed. Now you can experience and give agape. Love is an attitude of the heart. Love is not primarily an emotion or feelings, but an attitude of the heart. It is a gift from the Almighty for the blessing of humanity, for us to enjoy the benefit of care and commitment that relationships have to offer. True love is not bound by the way you feel, but rather it is a deliberate choice. This means you choose to love. This involves using your mind and reasoning 
faculties. It is commitment. This means you cannot truly love without commitment. It is not about what you want, but about what you give. We can conclude our definition of love by saying that love is first an attitude of the heart before it manifests in emotions and feelings. We can therefore define love as a force from the heart provoked by a sense of value which one recognizes in another person that causes one to prize them dearly. To end this chapter, these are the points to note. Number one, love is real, yet some people are ignorant of its true meaning, especially how to give and receive it. Number two, love is a gift from God, an instrument through which care and commitment is expressed. Number three, unconditional or covenant love is the foundation of strong marriages. Number four, friendship love must be present in a marital relationship as this makes the couple's friends for life. Number five, romantic love is expressed when consummating marriage and should only come after the couple has entered into a marital covenant. And number six, you can only experience and give agape when you have the nature of God, which comes with a new life in Christ Jesus. Now, we go on to see the power of love. Chapter 2, The Power of Love. Marriage thrives on love. As defined previously, love is a force from the heart, provoked by a sense of value which one recognizes in another person that causes one to prize them dearly. Love is a force. A force that can be defined, a force can be defined as a pull or a push. Love is a strong force that pulls good out of you towards another person. Songs of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Love is strong as death. Many waters cannot quench love. Neither can the floods drown it. It is the force of love that Jesus demonstrated when he gave himself as a sacrifice for man's sins. John 15, 13. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Love is a force of attraction. It is the force of love that attracts a man to a woman and makes him desire to keep her, care for her, and provide for her. The force of love causes a pull towards a particular person, and this is why attractions are singular in nature, meaning it is directed at a particular person. Love is a controllable force. Love is a force that can be controlled. That is, you can reason out the steps you are taking and why you love the person you desire to marry. This requires that you ask questions about who this person really is. Therefore, before acting purely on an attraction, pause and apply the truth of God's word by asking yourself Probing questions such as, is he or she a believer? Can we live together forever? Do we have the same beliefs and values? Love 
is a force of change. Love is a force that can change lives, destinies, and the universe. Set me as a seal upon thy heart, for love is as strong as death. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which have a most vehement flame. Songs of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Love is a healing force. As a force of change, love can bring about healing. Just as hate hurts, love heals. Jesus brought about healing in the five areas of man's life. Spiritual, physical, financial, social, and emotional. And Jesus went forth and was moved with compassion towards them, and he healed their sick. Matthew 14, 14. It was said that John G. Lake prayed for a woman dying of cancer. He was gripped with so much compassion that he wept as he prayed. And as his tears dropped and touched the woman's sick body, she was healed instantly. The power of love. The right love relationship can bring healing to the hurting one. As a force of change, one can drive a man to make sacrifices for the one he loves, as we see in the case of Jacob. His love for Rachel made him wait for 14 years to marry her. This virtue of patience is missing in the love relationships of today, as many want instant gratification. This is not true love. Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. Genesis 29, 20. A cementing force. As a force of change, Love makes couples strangers. Love makes complete strangers become covenant relations. This is because love is the fundamental building block of all human relationships. Pharaoh's daughter's compassion for the baby Moses caused her to rescue the baby in spite of her father's instruction to kill all male babies. Compassion is love in action. And when she had opened it, she saw the child and she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. And he became her son. And she called him Moses. Exodus 2, 6 to 10. It is the same way God's love for us caused us to be adopted to become sons of God. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God. 1 John 3, 1. Love is a seed. A seed is what you sow to reap a harvest. When you sow love in the lives of others, you are bound to reap a harvest of love in response. Also, as a seed, love has the capacity to grow, develop, and bring fulfillment in the lives of people. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Hebrews 10, 24. You sow seeds of genuine love by encouraging others to grow spiritually, intellectually, and in all areas of life. Love does not take advantage of people, rather, it gives advantage to others. Just as a seed is tangible, so is love. You can see its manifestation in action. The kingdom of heaven is like a seed sown. When it is grown, the birds of the air come and lodge. Matthew 13, 31 and 32. 
The manifestation of love does not bring about hurt, pain, or destruction. This is why love is not the same thing as lust. Seduction breeds lust and not love. Lust is an imitation of love. Love, lust, manifests in a very shallow way of thinking, such as a lifestyle that has an objective to turn hair. No decent man should marry a woman with such a way of thinking. Love affects the way we function. By affecting the way we function, it impacts our values and morals. It gives us a sense of well-being. Where there is no love, there is a loss of sense of well-being. It helps experience peace and consequently success as you reach your full potential in God. It brings out the best in you for service to humanity. Mother Teresa left an indelible mark on earth. She opened her heart to love others. Man's deepest need is to be loved. If it is not met, the result is struggles, depression, or loneliness. When you have an overwhelming desire to contribute to someone's life, it is an indication you love that person or you are in love and not just daydreaming about them. You cannot function well without love fervency of love. When two people who are genuinely in love become united in marriage, they become one. Love is the glue that binds them together as one. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. Genesis 2.24 this can be likened to a situation where the blacksmith hits a piece of metal until it is red hot. When two red hot pieces are brought together, they fuse to become one piece with this. Love each other deeply. 1 Peter 4.8 Strong marriages and homes are built on the good foundation of love. Selfishness ruins relationships. Every man is watching out for his own interest because many are need conscious rather than love conscious. One of the secrets of a blissful marriage is the eradication of selfishness. It is also a well-known fact that children that grow up in homes where parents love each other, genuinely have a better chance in life than those from homes where there is selfishness, quarreling, and bitterness. To conclude this chapter, it must be emphasized that the power of love is a transforming force that brings about positive changes in the lives of people. A classical example is that the love of God through Christ Jesus towards us is what brings about transformation of our lives. Now, points to note in this chapter. Number one, love is a force that attracts. Number two, it is a force that can be controlled. Number three, it is a force that changes lives, destinies, and the universe. Number four, it is a force that can bring about healing. Number five, it is a force that provokes sacrifices. Number six, it makes strangers become covenant relations. Number seven, Love is a seed 
that grows. Number eight, marriage thrives on love. And number nine, love is a force that transforms life. Now, we will look at the difference between counterfeits of love. Chapter 3, do not be naive. Love has counterfeits called infatuation and lust. Now that you know what love is and the power of love, the question we need to answer is how will you know if you are in love or if someone genuinely loves you? In seeking to answer these questions, we must understand that like any other thing in life, love has counterfeits. People talk about love at first sight, but actually love has to pass the test of time and durability before it can qualify to be true love. Love is not about what you see the first time, that is sight, but what you discern, that is foresight. Foresight is a product of knowledge. Love essentially functions in an environment of knowledge and full awareness of what you are doing and why you are doing it. Love makes intelligent decisions. Love is to be with discernment. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best. Philippians 1, 9 and 10, NIV version. Singles from generation to generation ask the question, how can I know true love? This is because love has counterfeits called infatuation and lust. They both present themselves as true love, but they are not. And many do not know how to distinguish between lust and love or infatuation and love. The dictionary defines infatuation as to be filled with an intense, unreasoning love. It is also defined as an intense but short-lived passion or admiration for someone or something. Oxford Dictionary. Both definitions reveal two vital truths as follows. Number one, infatuation cannot stand the test of time. This means it wears off with time. This is why when people fall in love, have the opportunity to be separated from each other. This is why when people fall in love and have the opportunity to be separated from each other for a while, the feeling of love wears off. The second truth to note is that infatuation steals your ability to reason. We have noted in chapter 1 that true love is always in control of emotions and your ability to reason. Lust, on the other hand, is an intense and unbridled sexual desire as defined by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Lust is described as a sexual urge. Also, we have seen while defining love in the first chapter that love is not sex. Let us therefore consider some examples of how love commonly presents itself as counterfeits in the lives of singles. Number one example, Geoffrey and Anne. Geoffrey was a 30-year-old, good-looking young man, while Anne was a 19-year-old student. 
They met at the wedding ceremony of Geoffrey's colleague. The attraction was so strong and intense that they both believed they were meant for each other. Geoffrey was nice and charming, the kind that can sweep any woman off her feet with his sweet words and expensive gifts. Anne fell for him very easily. Within a month of meeting, they had sex. Anne felt having sex with Geoffrey must be right since they were in love. Besides, Geoffrey had assured Anne he could not live without her and was willing to wait for her to complete her studies, after which they would get married. Anne believed sex was a sign of love and a way of encouraging intimacy. She soon found out it was not so. As the relationship progressed, one day she missed her period. Upon the advice of a friend, she went for a pregnancy test, and her worst fears were confirmed. She was pregnant. Geoffrey did not take kindly to the news. As a matter of fact, he stopped seeing her and would not pick her calls. Anne was left with the responsibility of bringing an innocent child into the world and caring for it without a father. Listen to this. This has been the story of many in search of love. Their search ended with heartache, frustration, shame, and dishonor. Many mismatched marriages do not endure because they were based on raw desire and lust that had been confused with love. Even if Geoffrey later decides to marry Anne, the inherent danger is that the sweet love has become sour and the marriage will be filled with lack of trust, emotional upheavals, pains, and shame. It is important to note that love is not sex. Another example, Grace and John. John is a 29-year-old successful engineer and a graduate from a good university with a second-class upper degree. He has all a lady thinks she needs or wants in a man, but he does not have any foundation spiritually. He is handsome, caring, romantic and smart, but not born again. Grace is a God-fearing girl who is diligently serving God and wants to keep herself until marriage. Meeting John changed that as she became madly in love with him, so much so that she forgot her core values. More like she loved him more than she loved God. When pressurized enough, she gave into premarital sex, thinking that would save the relationship and keep John. Unknown to her, John was busy with other girls. When she discovered, it was devastating for her, and the relationship ended, leaving grace with no relationship, no John, and no God in her life. What a price to pay. Listen to this. The only difference between charming and harming is the letter C, which is Christ. It is better to lose man than to lose God. Never compromise God. No relationship lasts long except that which stands on the rock of God's principles. The marital bed should be kept undefiled if you desire to the honor of being married as a virgin. This applies both to guys 
And to the ladies, God is love. And any love outside God is bound to be counterfeit. Another example, Robert and Glory. Glory and often met Robert, a salesman at a youth camp. They soon got friendly and started seeing each other regularly after they left camp. Robert is generous and provides for Glory's needs, such as her school fees, clothes, toiletries, and irregular pocket money. Robert comes from a background where he witnessed his father beat up his mother regularly. He soon discovered he was prone to the same behavior, as he sometimes gets into a rage when annoyed. One day, he actually hit glory. Although he later apologized and promised it would not happen again, it turned out that the beating became regular, after which he would turn around and plead with her. His explanation was his love was so intense he cannot help himself. Glory believed that it is part of love for her. This always makes her accept him back. Listen to this. True love is gentle. There is no violence in love. If you truly love someone, you will not hurt that person physically. If you have the tendency of being abusive, get help before getting into marital relationship. If you are in an abusive relationship, Break it up now. Sometimes people find it difficult to get out of an abusive relationship out of fear. This is unhealthy. If such people eventually get married, such marriages will not last. James and Janet. James and Janet have been dating for two years. Just when they were about to take the relationship to the next level, James got a scholarship to further his studies in a university in Canada. As proof that Janet would wait for him to return and marry her in England, he suggested that they swore an oath and enter into a blood covenant. Janet agreed as she believed they were in love and desired to spend the rest of their lives together. After James left England for Canada, he kept in touch for six months, after which he got caught up with a new life. He did not contact her for the next two and a half years. Since Janet did not hear from him, she decided to get married to someone else. However, James returned and showed up on a day to the wedding. Janet found herself in a dilemma and confused. She broke the oath which comes with consequences. Listen to this. Love should be subjected to tests. The test of time and distance would have helped to prove if their love was one of commitment. There should be mutual trust in a relationship. Premarital oath does not build trust, but brings fear. Couples are not in a covenant until they are contracted the marriage and are legally married to one another. This means there is no need to swear an oath or enter into a blood covenant while still in courtship. From the examples, we see that the quest for love has caused many to suffer frustration and pain. Their pursuit for love has left them disappointed, bewildered, and in some cases, 
skeptical as to whether true love exists or is merely a fairy tale. But true love does exist, as seen from the following example, Sarah and David. Sarah is 27 years old and faithful in the choir. She was trusting God for the right life partner, though she had some suitors in church. She prayerfully waited for an appropriate person from the Lord. David, 30, is a civil engineer. They both met at church when Sarah's car broke down and he offered to help out. That was how they started a relationship of friendship that blossomed and eventually led to marriage. They submitted their relationship to their pastor, who they met with at least once a month during their courtship. This helped them keep purity in their relationship and schooled them on what to expect in marriage as well as how to handle issues. They both love, value, and cherish each other and pursue God's purpose for their lives. A year into their marriage, David called his pastor to share the testimony of his one-year experience in marriage. He said, Pastor, everything you taught us is true. It is possible to have a great marriage and experience true love. It is truly working. God is faithful. Now listen to this. Love is patient, enduring, and places value on the other person. Submitting your relationship for godly guidance and counseling goes a long way to ensure the success of your courtship. When God is at work, every other thing works. Misconceptions about love. Number one misconception. Love is an uncontrollable feeling. Love is more than feelings or emotions. There is a reasoning dimension to love. True love reasons rationally. This is because true love gives. And for giving to be purposeful, it has to be done deliberately, cheerfully, excitedly, and with understanding. Number two, misconception. Love has to be accompanied with sex. Sex, in the context of marriage, is love. Outside marriage, it is lust. This is because true love will encourage obedience to God's word and demonstrate commitment. Where there is no commitment, there is no love. Misconception number three. When I get someone who loves me, I will truly be fulfilled and my search will end. This is not so, and it is wrong to seek for love from people simply because you want to be loved. The truth is, you are already loved by God the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3:16. Until you have received the love of God, your search for love will result in futility, heartaches, and frustration. This is because the void in our hearts can only be filled with the love of God. Ecclesiastes 3.11 He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end, NIV version. It is after you receive the love of God 
that you can truly be satisfied and pour out love to others without demanding for love. That is, you receive love without making obsessive demands for love. Multiple relationships and love. There is a common trend of multiple dating amongst youth nowadays. Having intimate relationship with more than one person. Amongst the guys, they flirt with many girls at the same time. In some quarters, this is erroneously seen as a sign of masculinity. Unfortunately, this is not so. Rather, it is an indication of wrong values and poor self-image. This act is not an evidence of true love. The same goes for the ladies. Ladies indulge in multiple relationships with different men, each serving different purposes. One man can serve the purpose of meeting her financial needs, while another serves the purpose of being a potential husband. Certainly, when you indulge in this act, you are exposed to premarital sex which makes you a loser in the long run. This is a clear evidence of poor spiritual and moral foundation. For both the guys and the ladies, when you get involved in multiple relationships at the same time, energy and resources go into those relationships. This is not the right way to learn how to love and give love. In the end, you will be love bankrupt. In concluding this chapter, it is important to note that the beginning of knowing how to love is first to have an understanding of love. This requires you also to know the counterfeits of love and infatuation, the counterfeits of lust and infatuation in order to watch out for the common pitfalls. Listen to this. Number one, love has counterfeits that present themselves as love, but they are not love. Number two, these counterfeits are infatuation and lust. Number three, they both cannot pass the test of time and durability Number four, they both are self-seeking. Number five, true love always delays gratification. And number six, multiple relationships at the same time will not help you learn to love, but rather will leave you love bankrupt. The next chapter, we will be looking at where are you looking for love. Chapter 4, where are you looking for love? God is love. He is the source of love. Love proceeds from God and he imparts us with his love, with his nature, which is the nature of love. God is love. Therefore, before you can give love, you must be imparted with love from God, the source of God, of love. God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Ghost, by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. Romans 5.5 5. What you do not have you cannot give. As such as I have, give I thee. Acts 3 6. If you have not been imparted with love, you are not in a position to give true love that is lasting and enduring. When you receive Jesus Christ as Lord, the seed of love is sown in you. 
but it has to be developed and shared with others through exercise. How to exercise love. It is feeding on the word of God daily that helps us develop and sustain working in love. Love becomes our nature when God dwells in us. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. 1 John 2, 5. Just as natural food is important to sustaining our physical energy, the word of God as spiritual food is what we need to give us spiritual stamina in order to walk in love through continuous exercise. There are practical steps to be taken that will ensure you stay on the right path and continuously exercise love. Applying these steps in your everyday life will also help you to grow in love. Seven ways of exercising love. Number one, sacrifice. This is making sacrifice for others. Convenience is a trap to failure. Never wait for perfect conditions before you show love. You may wait forever. Therefore, seize every opportunity that comes your way to do good, even if it demands making sacrifices. Greater love has no man than this that a man laid down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. Number two, giving. This is being generous in sharing what you have for others. A wise man once said, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God demonstrated his love by giving. Even if I dole out all that I have to the poor in providing good, and if I surrender my body to be born, where are you looking? And even, let me take that. Even if I dole out all my, all that I have to the poor in providing food and I surrender my body to be born in order that I may glory, but have not love, God's love in me, I gain nothing. 1 Corinthians 13, 3. Number three, caring. This is showing care and concern for other people. An example is Nehemiah, who was born in captivity but cared about his people. Most importantly, he took positive steps to effect a change in the situation by alleviating their plight. Caring always ends up in action. Nehemiah 1, verses 2 to 4. Hananiah came and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that left, left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. When I heard the words, I wept, and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Number four, forgiveness. Forgiveness is refusing to take into account the wrong others have done to you. Luke 17, verses 3 or 4 says, If your brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, thou shalt forgive him. Number five, endurance. 
to endure means to be able to withstand hardship or adversity. Adverse circumstances and situations should not be strong enough to change your love for someone. This demands being persistent. Hebrews 12, 2 and 3. Looking unto Jesus, who endured the cross, considered him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Number six, respect. Giving respect to others include being courteous to them, to both the young and the old. True love is to respect each other's values, beliefs, and boundaries. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, and the wife reverence her husband. Ephesians 5.33 Number seven, obedience. Love for God is reflected in obeying his commandments, and one commandment is the commandment to love. True love demands cooperation with each other for the success of the relationship. For instance, in a marriage, the wife must cooperate with her husband for a stress-free marriage. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loves God loves his brother also. 1 John 4, 21. Why is love important in our relationships? Number one, it is a commandment. God commands us to love. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. Number two, Love is our distinguishing characteristic as Christians. That is, love is our trademark. John 13, 35. Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Number three, we are useless without love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. The Amplified Version renders it this way. If I can speak in tongues of men and even of angels, but have not love, that reasoning, intentional, spiritual devotion, such as inspired by God's love for us and in us, I am only a noisy gong or a glanging symbol. And if I have prophetic powers, the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose, and understand all the secrets, truths, and mysteries, and possess all knowledge, and I, if I have sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, God's love in me, I am nothing, a useless nobody. Number four, our faith works by love. Galatians 5, 6. But faith worketh by love. This means faith is important, yet without love, it cannot work. Number five, love is the manifestation of our divine nature. 1 John 4, 9 and 11. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, beloved. If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And number six, our relationships are shallow 
without covenant law, the foundation for commitment. In this chapter, we have learned that God is the authentic source of love. He imparts us with his divine nature of love before we can love others genuinely. However, we need to continue to grow in love by feeding on God's word, the food of the spirit, and by exercising ourselves in walking in love. Listen to this. God is love. 1 John 4, 16. And love starts from the recreated man. The Holy Spirit impacts love and teaches us how to love. Romans 5, 5. Contemporary English version, version renders it this way. God has given us the Holy Spirit who feels our hearts with his love. Love is to be not love is to be nurtured with God's word and subjected to exercise for it to grow. Continuous exercise is what keeps love alive. In the next chapter, we will learn that God we will Get to know that love has to be learned. Okay. Hmm? Chapter 5. Take it slow and easy. Love has to be learned. Man's desire to love and be loved requires an understanding of love. In chapter 1, it was stated that a mystery has to be unveiled and learnt. This means love must be learnt. People make the mistake of thinking and behaving as though love is not to be learnt, but that it lies dormant in man waiting to be steered into existence when struck by passion for someone. This is not so. For this reason, many wait forever searching endlessly, but to no avail. Some have spent the whole of their lives trying to find love. In the process, they have been battered, and they have given up. Worse still, some die without truly discovering it. It has been said that countless studies and numerous research papers attest to the idea that love is a learned response, a learned emotion. Also, the scriptures reveal that love is to be learned. As we see in Titus chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it says, The aged women, likewise teachers of good things, may teach the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. Love has to be learned because man's nature changed after sin entered the world. This nature changed from love to selfishness. Selfishness is a self-seeking character that makes man to always look out for his own interest and not put the interest of others ahead of his. Selfishness is the reason for divorce. This is why the issue of selfishness must be dealt with before you consider marriage. It is love that has the power to eradicate selfishness from our lives, relationships, and marriages. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires and lusts that battle within you? James 4.1 It is therefore, it therefore becomes mandatory that people take time to invest in acquiring knowledge on how to love and grow in love before considering marriage. This is an all-important subject 
that will always affect our lives and destiny. As man's deepest emotionally need, love is not something that you can assume. It has to be learned and consciously cultivated before it can become a lifestyle. Proverbs 30, verses 18 to 19. The Good News Translation has this to say. There are four things that are too mysterious for me to understand. A man and a woman falling in love. It is true our old nature has changed. And we are now imparted with the nature of love when we get born again. However... This is just the beginning of the journey. We now have to learn how to love. And this is by renewing our minds with the word of God. The good news is, with the new nature, we have the Holy Spirit as our teacher and helper in the school of love. What do we learn about love? The three areas of a man that reflects love is in his thoughts, words, and deeds. One has to learn to inculcate love in these three realms. You learn to think love. People who truly love think differently. They think love. Love thoughts are good thoughts. When love gains mastery over our thoughts, you act like God. This is because love is the very essence of God. To have love thoughts is to have God's thoughts. We all know the importance of thoughts in our lives. Our thoughts affect everything about us, our speech and our actions. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. You learn to speak love words. When your heart is full of love thoughts, you certainly will speak love words. Speaking love words is speaking right words. Speaking words that give hope, affirmation, and assurance. Matthew 12 says, For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, 21 and 22. You learn acts of love. It is an act of love to give. John 3, 16, remember? For God so loved the world, he gave. Learning the act of kindness is a deliberate thing. In marriage, kindness makes couples relate with devotion and commitment to one another. Love is also giving your partner the right of way. This can be illustrated by what happens with motorists at a roundabout. Everyone wants to move at the same time, but for there to be order, Driving rules instruct that motorists are to give way to traffic on the right in countries where you have the right-hand drive and give way to traffic on the left in countries where the left-hand drive is practiced. The book of Esther is a book of love, but the word love is never mentioned anywhere there. However, it is full of love deeds. Love, therefore, is expressed in actions. 
Love is kind and patient, never jealous, never boastful, never proud or rude. Love is not selfish or quick-tempered. Love does not keep a record of wrongs that others do. Rather, love rejoices in the truth, but not in evil. Love is always supportive, loyal, hopeful, and trusting. Love never fails. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 8, contemporary English version. This makes love a deliberate choice you make, and it is reflected in how you handle people, how you eagerly assist others towards achieving their goals, how you contribute to the greatness of others. You should not be a part of destroying others. Rather, help them secure their destiny to blossom and become what God wants them to be. Therefore, learning to love is learning to sow seeds of love in your thoughts, in your love words, and in your love deeds. Now that we know the source of love and how to exercise love continually, how then do we cultivate our relationships with love? How to cultivate love motivated relationship. Number one, learn to love. Isaiah 117 says, learn to do it right. New International Version. God expects us to learn to love. Become a student of love. Study love. Pray about love. And develop the fruit of the Spirit. In learning to love, you learn to love God first, then you'll be able to love others. Deuteronomy 6, 5 says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. One way you can learn to love is learning by observation. This means, Locate others that are successfully working in love and observe them. As you observe, you get a picture of how to demonstrate love to God and others. You practice what you see by mimicking them. As the saying goes, it is practice that makes perfect. This is a powerful tool that helps you to become what you ought to be. Change your mindset. Number two. To change your mindset requires renewing your mind on what love is and how it is expressed. This renewal is obtained through God's word. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. NIV version. One school of thought that needs to be changed is that love is sex. Love is not sex. Rather, true love waits for marriage before sex. You also need to understand the three dimensions in which love is expressed. Covenant love, friendship love, and romantic love. Number three, demonstrate love at all times and at every opportunity. Love is to be demonstrated or exercised. This we discussed in the previous chapter while discussing the seven practical steps in which love can be exercised. Be a lover of people by showing care, respect, and consideration. Love gives, therefore make giving your culture. Ask yourself, when last did I give 
someone something. For instance, when last did I go out of my way to make my loved ones, my parents, my spouse, my friend, or even my children happy by giving surprise gifts? Listen to this. Love is to be learned. You learn by cultivating love thoughts. You learn by cultivating the speaking of love words. You learn by cultivating love deeds or actions. You know you are in love by first learning to love. It is then you have understood true love. It is when you have understood true love that you can recognize true love and know if someone truly loves you. In the next chapter, we shall be looking at understanding love. Understanding what makes for real love. Chapter 6. Watch your steps. Understanding love makes for real love. It is your level of understanding that will determine your level of commitment to love. Bishop Bredepo once said, It is understanding that makes outstanding. We can therefore say, Understanding love makes for outstanding commitment. In building good and solid relationships, you need to learn how to love and continually develop it. Love grows. This translates to the fact that it can be developed. If you are born again, the seed of love is in you. Thus, you need to develop it. Love is for the good and welfare of another. And what you don't have, you can't give. Herein is our love made perfect. 1 John 4, 17. Now that we understand what true love is and how to develop it, we shall go further to find out the how-to that will help us build a love affair that will eventually produce a successful marriage. Falling in love is a process that has a beginning and proceeds to maturity. How to fall in love. Number one, your nature determines your nurture. The beginning of love is having the nature of love. We have come to understand the, that this comes by God imparting us with his nature, the nature of love. This nature is imparted through the process of new birth, which means to be born again. The impartation of eternal life unto you is what results in the recreated spirit. Remember, selfishness is the nature of the fallen man, and until the old man nature is replaced with God's nature, genuine love, agape, cannot be given. It is the God kind of love. It is the God kind of life that gives the God kind of love. Agape, which imparts people around and ultimately our environment. Number two, renew your mind on the true meaning of love and how it is expressed by understanding the three dimensions in which love is expressed. That is, your thoughts, your words, and your actions. Number three, understand the foundation of love. Unconditional love is that foundation on which a relationship of commitment can be built. This enhances endurance, stability, and sacrifice which are the virtues that sustain marriage. If you start from romance, you can only go as far as friendship because of the self-centeredness 
and the insecure nature of man, which tends to make humans want to protect their hearts and interests. It is agape that makes all the difference. Number four, prayerfully commit your love life to God. God is love personified, and he will show you the way to love. Become a student of love by studying how to love, praying about love, and developing the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Number five, be sensitive, watchful, and observant. Look out for people that have the same kind of understanding of love like you. Persons that potentially can love you and you can love in return. This is a powerful tool that will keep you from the wrong people and help you become what you ought to be. Number six, nurture the seed of love in you. Respond positively to the openings and opportunities that come your way to demonstrate love to others. This is how love becomes a way of life. Number seven, build friendship first in relationships that has marriage in view. Generally, in relating with the opposite sex, it is advised to do this first. Friendship is necessary for bonding in a marriage. Number eight. Falling in love is a process that you must have control over. It all begins with an attraction, but attraction does not have to be fatalistic as it is uncontrollable. This means you do not have to fall in love with the wrong person. 1 Corinthians 14.32 says this, The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophet. That means you can't be in control of your emotions. To be attracted to someone means that person arouses your interest. It does not mean you relinquish control. Your reasoning must therefore be intact even when falling in love. Number nine, do not rush things. When you rush into a relationship, you would most certainly rush out of it. Therefore, get to know each other well by developing strong communication and companionship. This means learn to enjoy each other's company without romantic inclinations. Number 10, never engage in premarital sex. It always fails. It will destroy the maturity process of love and truncate or shorten its growth. Number 11, deal wisely. Be transparent and be honest with one another. Number 12, prove all things and choose that which is true. Allow your relationship to pass the test of time and truth. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 Test. Hold on to what is good. New International Version. Number 13. Submit your relationships to godly counselors and mentors for guidance. Proverbs 11.14 Proverbs 15.22 Proverbs 20:18 and Proverbs 24:6 all show that in the multitude of counselors there is safety. Number 14.
promote togetherness, oneness, and unity with God, his word, and with one another. Engage in kingdom service together. It promotes God dependency and fortifies friendship. Number 15. Make the process of falling in love meaningful, purposeful, and result-oriented. Avoid idle persons and time wasters. Get involved in a profitable relationship and make it work. To conclude this chapter, it is important to appreciate the fact that you know how to love by learning to love just as you learn courtesy, politeness, respect, and other virtues. In other words, you can learn to give true love and expect to get true love in return. You will also easily discern or recognize love. This is important because falling in love is an experience to be shared by two people getting to know and love each other. The couple definitely must have in view a life together in marriage. For the experience to be one that will result in a strong bond and a stable marriage, both parties must maintain sensitivity and vigilance and keep premarital sex completely out of the process. Sex is meant to be the icing on the cake, a reward for patiently developing the fruit of love during courtship. It is not meant to be brought in until the couple has entered into the covenant of marriage at the point of exchange of vows before a cloud of witness. This is what makes sex a covenant too. Now listen to this. Falling in love is a process. It is a deliberate act carried out with your reasoning faculties. It is not beyond your control. It is meant to be an experience between two people getting to know each other and building the platform of love for an enduring marital relationship. In the next chapter, we shall look at how to experience healing for heartbrokenness, for heartbreaks. Chapter 7, Healing for the Brokenhearted. If you have been hurt, it does not mean you cannot love again. It was Thomas Edison who said, You have not learned not to love. You have only learned what love is not. This is indicative of the fact that if you have failed in your previous love relationships, it does not make you a failure. All that is required is that you need to stop, educate yourself, and be wise. Practical steps for healing. Number one, open up to God to heal you of past hurts. This is important because wounds go deep and they do not heal fast. Someone once said, hurting people hurt others. However, there is a balm that heals all wounds, no matter how deep or how bad it hurts. Jeremiah 8.22 Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of my daughter, of the daughter of my people recovered? The good news is there is a balm in Gilead, and Jesus is that balm. He can heal you of your wounds. Number two, 
Embrace God's love for healing wounds. In the process, you may need to be reconciled back to God if you have drifted away as a result of the failed relationship. Sometimes, people get caught up relation with relationships that they let down their guard, compromise their values, and grow cold or lukewarm spiritually. This happens when they allow the relationship to take up all their time and do not have and do not give God his place. Number three, review the past relationship in order to learn from your mistakes. One of the mistakes you may need to correct is to stop looking for love in the wrong place. Get secured in the love of God for you that never fails and gives a sense of true security and stability in life. People who do not possess the nature of love and know nothing about love are not capable of giving love, no matter how nice they are. Therefore, beware. Number four, let go of the past. Letting go of the past requires you to stop dwelling on past hurts and mistakes. Learn from your mistakes and move on. If you keep looking back, you will not be able to lay hold on the better future ahead that God has reserved for you. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, New International Version. People who look back eventually become monuments, like what happened to Lot's wife when she looked back. She became a pillar of salt. Genesis nineteen twenty six. Letting go of the past will also require you forgive those that hurt you and forgive yourself as well. Remember, you do not drive a car by looking back. You can end up with a crash. No one drives into the future by looking continually at past mistakes. Number five. Begin to prepare for the new things God wants to make happen for you. To prepare effectively, you need to learn what love is before you can give or receive love. When there is no connection in relationships, you need to check your ideas about love. People are void of true love because they have the wrong perspective of what love is. Remember, Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks, so is he. If your understanding of love is corrupted by getting your definition of love from the wrong source, then you cannot give love. Neither will you appreciate love when it is given. You also need to seek to give true love and not the counterfeit. Remember, love is a seed that has to be sown if you are to reap the harvest of love. Genesis 8.22 Seed time and harvest. Number five, take your time. Do not go into another relationship 
until you are healed completely of the past hurt. Make sure you are ready to love genuinely and consciously avoid the previous mistakes. Be sensitive and let the Spirit of God guide you into choosing who to love and how to respond to love. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Romans 8, 14. In concluding this chapter, it is important to note, to know that a failed relationship does not mean you cannot love again. There is hope for you. Therefore, move on to what God has reserved for you. God is a God of restoration. He will restore. Listen to this. If you have been hurt before, it does not mean you cannot hurt. You cannot. If you have been hurt before, it does not mean you cannot love again. Retrace your steps back to God for healing and restoration. Three, learn the lessons from the past in order not to repeat the same mistakes. Four, forget the past. Forgive those that hurt you. Forgive yourself of your errors. And five, look ahead into the future. There is hope for you. Conclusion. We have seen that love is more than emotions and more than just feeling good. True love goes beyond feelings. It is not bound by the way you feel. Love is a choice you make by the deliberate actions you take. You choose to love with your mind and reasoning faculties. You choose to love with your mind and reasoning faculties in place. The demand of love is commitment. You cannot truly love without commitment. Love turns you into a giver. Love is not about what you want. Love is about what you give. It means to contribute to the greatness of others, not to destroy them. It is helping another person secure his or her destiny, thereby seeing another person blossom and becoming what God wants him or her to be. Love will make you successful in handling. Love will make you successful in the handling of your relationships especially the relationship that will lead to marriage. Love is a mystery. It can be taught, understood, and eventually become a lifestyle. God bless you as you learn to love. Peace. Experience a new life. If you have never invited Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I invite you to do so now. Pray this prayer sincerely and you will experience a new life in Christ. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me on the cross. Thank you for paying the price for my sin. I believe you resurrected from the dead and you now sit at the right hand of God the Father. I ask that you forgive me of my sins, and I invite you to come and live inside me. I make you my Lord from today. I surrender my life to you. Thank you for saving me. Now believe Jesus is living in your heart if you pray that prayer. You are forgiven and made righteous. You need to be a part of a Bible-believing church and grow in the world. John 8, 
31 and 32 says, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I exhort you to take hold of the word of God, plant it in your heart. 2 Corinthians 3.18 assures us that as you look into the word, you will be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. God bless you. For contact, please note the following. For counseling or further ministry, you can contact Joy Ajibade on email joyajibade at yahoo.com by email at joyajibade at yahoo.com by telephone plus one five one six two six zero double eight five nine in the United States. In Nigeria, plus two three four eight zero double eight three four three triple one or plus two three four eight zero double three two zero seven zero one four. She will be delighted to hear your testimonies. God bless you.